Welcome. Anybody that's in the back that would like to sit up in the front, you can uh, come on up. You won't be asked any questions after the lecture, so don't worry. Welcome. After the lecture this evening, Angeli Cafe, down at the end of the building, is going to be open for uh, your dinner needs if you're hungry. Um, next week, we have an architect named Svi Hecker, an Israeli architect that's currently doing the first school for Jewish children in Berlin. He's going to be here to present that and some of his other work. Um, part of that evening's uh, events, there will be a woman named Christine Ferreis who will give a brief introduction to the work that's currently going on in Berlin. She's one of the uh, most respected and successful gallery um, owners in Europe and is one of the two, I think, important galleries in, on architecture in the world. So that's next Wednesday night. Ah, also, I would like to thank the British Consulate um, for helping sponsor this lecture this evening. Nigel Coates. Nigel, I think, um, should be admired for a number of reasons, but for one, I think, for creating his own opportunities at a time when there hasn't been much work for most architects around the world, particularly in England. Um, I think one of the reasons that this has been the case, the reason he's been able to do work besides attracting uh, clients because of his talent is that I think he is part of a new breed that has looked at the world in a new way, in a more experimental and in, an inventive way. Um, his approach is best I know it from the work that I've known of, of uh, this last period, has explored ideas through collaboration both in the school environment working with students as well as bringing in a, a range of unusual artists and craftspeople directly into the projects. He studied at the AA and taught there from 1974, or I guess by 79 to 89, I suppose. I, he, I know that he taught there for about 10 years. During that period, it was a, it was a time when open-minded creative types we're caught up in the spirit momentum of the merging of music, fashion, and publishing. It was a period that uh, punk rock emerged out of England. And I think that there was a few uh, whose work, I think, ev was, was evidence to really questioning conventional hierarchies in, in England. He was certainly one of them. He formed a group called NATO, Narrative Architecture Today, with his students at the AA, exploring the culture of the city beyond architecture, publishing some of the work in a magazine, used video, other popular culture technology, put on exhibitions that were both provocative and wild. All of this, I think, was to uh, rethink the life of the city as a force that would determine its form, the culture of the city. In 1985, he developed his own firm, Branson Coates. Developed a considerable reputation r rather quickly with projects in Japan, Metropole, Cafe Bongo, Noah's Art, and the, and the Wall. The projects characterized, were characterized by a complex collective vision of these artists that he brought together, um, himself as the sort of leading conceptual force and empresario. The work was 
rich in, I think, in the, the art form that it gives, both in the furniture and in the details of the, uh, the buildings themselves. Um, it included the work of designers Tom Nixon and Andre Gabriel, who are um, actually the work that they've done independent has been quite exceptional. Um, I know for a fact that it's uh, quite a feat to bring in um, uh, people of such talent into the work and give them the room to maneuver in a way that ultimately the entire piece benefits. Although he's completed most of his work outside of Britain, he's taken advantage of devices, I've been told, like a uh, fax machine and video that allow him to work in many places at the same time while he is based in Britain. The work that he's done, I think, and the spirit in which it was done, I think, connects him to this place as it's connected many of the architects that have come out of the AA. Um, I think the combination of both uh, teaching and practice and the experimental nature of the work and most importantly the uh, courage to take the risks that he continually takes um, I think may, seems quite natural that he's in this place at this time. I look forward to listening to his words and to seeing the work uh, in slides. With that I give you Nigel Coates. Thanks, Michael. I was at the Art Center over in Pasadena this morning, and um, the lecture theater there was, was like the Odeon Leicester Square. It wasn't a hangar like this. I feel much more comfortable here. I've got a nice, uh, real, old-fashioned pointer, not a, not a laser star that I can waft around on the wall. And um, when I was in coming into the building just now, I thought I'd just pop into the the restroom for a second and there was a man in a skirt. So I feel at home here. <laughs> There's something funny going on in this place and um, I like it. So let's have some slides. <laughs> I have to say next every time but um, would you forgive me that I'm not going to bang the stick as I heard someone did last week. Besides apparently it <laughs> It makes a lot of trouble for the media people, whoever they are. Hello. So, next, please. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about London, and this is partly for me as well as for you, because having been in Japan and, um, for three days and here for four days, to tell you the truth, I've nearly forgotten what it's like to be in London. Um, but London, like all European cities, you'll know, is, uh, is one that is the result of countless accumulations, a very, very complicated city that could swamp us with its sense of history and um, leave us pretty uh, unable to, to act as architects, artists, or whatever. Next, please. But it depends sort of how you look at it. Of course, London is a city which was let's say, founded by the Romans, um, grew mostly in the medieval period to just establish its, um, its street pattern, burnt down, was rebuilt by Wren, had uh, very um, uh, uh, effective whorehouses on the south bank of the Thames. It was a pretty raunchy place. Um, but it soon, uh, in, the, in the course of, uh, of becoming the focus of the largest empire there's ever been, um, of course, started to uh, absorb the riches, the wealth from the rest of the world. And you know, no point in going into the Industrial Revolution, but when we see Southwark Cathedral from the air, as here on the left, um, it's very clear that infrastructures of successive ages have, have uh, planted themselves on top of one another. And, um, I mean, even in the way that, that buildings are repaired, there's a sort of overlaying, an accumulation, uh, a disguising, a revealing. There, um, there therefore exists 
um, a, a territory so rich in cultural, social, economic evidence that I think this aspect of the city has to be taken on board uh, in a positive sense for architecture. Next, please. And this is too true, uh, this is also true when um, experiencing the life of the city as, a, as a, an occupant of it. Um, the streets are full there. It's kind of spooky here where the streets aren't full. You know, I've got the natural road to rush off to, to Santa Monica where there are actually people walking about. Feel more comfy there. Um, or on the right hand side, uh, uh, Portobello Road, where the, um, the actual accumulations on the building and the activity in the street with this um, uh, market barrow somehow tell us that there is a, a sense of spatial intensity that comes from the activities of the city and not just from the building. Next, please. Next, please. <laughs> kind of a wrap. The Strand, with not much traffic on it. A very important axis linking St. Paul's Cathedral and um, Buckingham Palace. A street that was one in the 19th century, one of the richest, if not the richest in Europe. Lots of banks, lots of coffee houses, um, the law courts, and lots of evidence of, um, of the empire. Lots of money to be spent. Uh, a considerable number of buildings that cannot be touched. But on the right, the evidence that um, an awful lot of building has been happening over the last 15 years during the Thatcher period. Not much of it of a civic nature. In fact, hardly anything except for the British Library. And uh, in the dim distance, you'll see the outline of Canary Wharf, the biggest disaster of them all. Next, please. In fact, it's, it's, uh, these are relatively good buildings of the 1980s, but um, I can't say I like either of them very much. Terry Farrell's uh, attempt to, to work with the language of the great railway sheds, building an office block over the top of Charing Cross Station, adjacent to the river, but um, pretty fake. Looks like an organ when it's lit up at night and um, doesn't seem to show a lot of sensitivity to the way that those buildings on the Strand used to be, later be related to the river or um, a bit of Americana in the form of Broadgate uh, 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 shopping and office complex. I think at the stage of the model and the photograph kind of gives away the mood of what those, that complex was about. Even so, better than most, one of the reasons um, because uh, there were lots of commission works of art that actually did make it into, into a, a valid public space. Next, please. But this contrast between uh, official corporate architecture seems to um, uh, be uh, totally opposed to another mood of the city, which is very, very evident now. A uh, lot of people sleeping on the streets, under bridges, um, particularly like this one, because I thought they'd pose as Michelangelo's sculptures to suit the, um, the setting. But every morning on my ride to work on my motorbike, I see this thing. Um, and that one speaks for itself. Next, please. Next, please. But there's a, this kind of polarization. I think, um, I mean, I know I, it's dangerous to make sweeping statements, but, but cultural ideas tend to fall in Britain into um, those that arise from the aristocratic uh, side of society and those that arise from working class side of society. Of course, most people are middle class, but um, in terms of the formation of morals and, and uh, social ideals, they tend to be those opposites still in operation, which means on the one hand that Britain is very traditional, um, you know, Britain as theme park, but on the other, there's a kind of spirit of resistance um, in in music and fashion. Um, not to say that here, an advertisement that I believe is banned here, whilst your cowboys from Marlborough are banned in Britain. Anyway, we get this where gay people are apparently 
uh, branded as separate, um, all to help sell Benetton's little woolly sweaters. Thank you. Next one. And this sort of um, tendency to, to separate even spaces, of course, must be um, something to do with uh, uh, what was the BR suggestion on the right, or um, let's, let's forget about the city altogether and pop an E pill on the left. Thank you. Next one. So what position are we in? It seems on the one hand we're kind of... Uh, bound by the, the conventions that seem to make uh, the city impossible to work in. It seems to be impossible to, to make an architecture which in some way uses um, these sorts of, of opposites and conflicts. It seems that uh, uh, the red light says stop. Next, please. Next. There's a spirit of... Um, of deviation, which I guess is at the heart of uh, the nature of the avant-garde. It's been um, in culture ever since um, people like Oscar Wilde and Whistler and Riesmann and others actually took on board the notion of that which was um, thought to be deviant by society as a whole um, to incorporate it somehow back into its cultural production. Um, we seem to be quite good at that in Britain, as Lee Barry on the left shows. Uh, a person who, in fact, came from Australia, but he's become thoroughly uh, part of the, of the of British scene, first appeared in the club scene maybe 15 years ago, uh, dressed as Krishna with a green face and a, and a chain going from his nose to his ear. And... Um, appearing frequently in nightclubs as all sorts of things, from a Christmas pudding to a light bulb, and um, here in a recent picture, um, complete with uh, 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 mouth-attached safety pins that go through two holes, which turned out to be a bit of a disaster because he wanted to make his mouth look as though it would light up. So he pierced his cheeks in two places so that um, fiber optic fibers could go through the hole, then when he'd open his mouth, it would appear to light up. Anyway, they went very separate and very funny. So, um, here he's wearing them adorned, or, I mean, Cindy Sherman's uh, work, work too. Somehow, um, bringing to our attention those uh, elements, those unspoken of elements of uh, uh, peripheral culture put forward to um, emphasize the fact that these two are, are part of them. Um, uh, they should be represented, they can be represented, they ask questions about what, um, what kind of aesthetic we can aspire to now, what kind of lives we're living. Next, please. And this tradition, of course, is particularly hot in the punk era, when Malcolm McLaren and others would take uh, signs of the status quo, and of course, to have, how near the status quo can you get than the Queen? Or in recent tendencies in fashion, I mean, look what's happened to the ideal image of architecture. It's a completely um, decayed, rat infested, nothing space um, with a faded grandeur. And the model is, um, she is sort of showing the clothes, but. Um, She's, uh, she's definitely got a different mood. This is, this is not the vogue that we knew. Next, please. And this incorporation, this folding in of absurdity, absurdity deviancy, uh, appropriation, the edges, is, of course, now acceptable and even um, expected in realm of art, such as um, Clemente's uh, series of uh, extraordinary little sexual burlesque scenes, which I think is so brilliant because it includes us, the viewers, in it. It gives us a sense of, of space and depth without the conventional perspective. Or someone else whose work I enjoy very much, Gordon Matter clark on the, on the right-hand side, with cuts through uh, a, a conventional office building in Antwerp, one of the last projects he did before he died to make a completely second-order space 
that made all sorts of questions about the notion of context and the specific uh, nature of the site in relation to the action of the artist. All matters which I think have a lot to do with um, how, uh, how, certainly how I behave and, and uh, as an architect. Next, please. But I think it's worth looking too at um, examples of architecture which are not really buildings or other phenomena that seem to have something to do with um, aspects of the, of the essence of building. And I could have chosen lots of slides that are about movement, but um, I think this dance uh, really shows quite clearly that a space, a building, is formed by the people who are watching and the costumes and the way those dancers are moving has actually got a, a composition, a sense of proportion, a sense of space which is not a million miles away from architecture. Or on the left, yes, it's sensual, it's, a, um, it's a unacceptable as a um, as a, a, just a, a pretty picture of a, of a landscape. But what the reason it's here is that it draws the parallel between the landscape qualities of the body and what happens when you bring two things that are totally opposite, the body and the landscape, into proximity. Is there something that um, ricochets between the other? Is there something in common between the two? The landscape of the body, the body as an object, as opposed to here, the, the body as, um, as perceived, and here as the, the, um, the condition from which we actually see those people moving. Next, please. On the right, um, another example of architecture which is sort of there by implication. And of course there are many, many examples of a of a just enough there to see as architecture in gardens, in Italian gardens of, uh, of the late Renaissance. Um, this, this is a little garden in, in Siena and uh, we're looking at the, the theatre in the garden which is at the end of quite a long walk along a ridge from the house. And of course it's a space, of course it's, of course it's a, a building by, by inference with its um, four little rows of seats now completely covered in ivy um, and we are looking at the auditorium uh, from where I'm standing here from the stage. It's um, this total greenery just like decay, like uh, the, the, the dance space, they're, they're examples which in some way can be folded back into the experience of building. And on the left, um, a glimpse of one of our projects at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, where there's an enormous object outside the window that's actually bigger than the building itself in some ways, or bigger, than, bigger in proportion than the building that we're in. And um, you'll see later how these signs of nature, like this wave and these fish, uh, fit into one of the projects that we've done there. Next, please. I like the way that um, traffic is organized to move because it's a concretization of movement in a way that architecture normally wouldn't, um, wouldn't engage. Very practical vocabulary, the yellow lump traffic lights, but uh, quite beautiful shapes in the way that the curbs in those little traffic islands are are mediating between the world of the pedestrian and the world of the car. There's a shop called Harvey Nichols in London, which is one of the smartest shops in town. It's in Knightsbridge. And they're usually pretty clever at picking up on these sorts of nuances and what kind of transgressions are around at the time. Well, at the moment, they've got these, uh, these colors that we seem to be seeing a lot of, these sort of muddy colors. And they've actually um, taken out a, a license for scaffolding and they've built a completely new facade wrapped around the existing one. And all this is just done for display, just to make the windows. The next one, please. 
So, often our work is not building as such. They are circumstances, in any case, a little bit like the ones I've shown you. They're sort of marginal. And it was marginal from the start to ask us to do this cafe in Tokyo. Cafe Bongo is probably the most photographed project with this picture. In actual fact, not really blue. It doesn't really look like this, but uh, made a nice picture. The concrete building that we had to work inside, you can see the sign of Paco above, and this soffit that went back to a two-story high window. And um, they wanted a pretty wild cafe because there were a lot of other buildings on this street which are unbelievably wild. You know, when you show this to a Western audience, they think, oh God, how did you get away with that? Well, believe you me, there's a lot of stuff that's very noisy either side of it. And in fact, I'd even say that this is quite subtle compared with some of the stuff around it. And it, I mean, it reveals one of the basic um, ways in which, which uh, uh, the practice and I work, which is to crash or blend two completely opposite ideas into one another. But that all came from the client's uh, request. We want a really uh, a strong image, they would say, and we want it to be international, and want it to be ancient, and want it to be about people getting to know the rest of the world and all that. So you try to add up all this stuff, and of course it doesn't really form a brief. So you put it all in. That's the way you do it. So you have aircraft, you have an aircraft wing um, with great spotlights coming out of the, the, uh, the jet. But then inside, a very, um, uh, a very fluid, um, curved space at the back of which is a wall that refers to ancient Rome, refers to uh, baths of Caracalla, to great, the great structures of, um, of antiquity. These two things did have something to do with each other in our mind. We all watched uh, La Dolce Vita at uh, the beginning of this project. All the artists that were involved, and the guy who did the, the painting on the ceiling, the guy, the guy who did the special photographic artwork, the girl who who blended a lot of trash that we air freighted out to Japan, including old shoes and broken telephones and all the rest of it, were bedded into this back wall. Um, so we, um, we thank Fellini for the beginning of this project. I think Fellini would understand what I'm talking about tonight. Or on the, on the left, a, a, a set that was done for La Sang TV, um, which was for a debating show. And the host of the debating show, um, Guillaume Durand, he, he wanted to have a, a space like, the, like, the, like the, um, the, the House of Commons at Westminster, because he associates that with an extraordinarily um, unbridled uh, barking at each other from one side of the house to the other, as you might have heard on, or seen on TV. And in fact, he was totally out of control with this, but it, it, it was quite an amusing way of setting up a chat show, much more vigorous than would be in England. Uh, and in actual fact, people would just stand up and shout their heads off. It was unbelievable. And he did nothing to intervene. I wasn't there the night this photograph was taken, but it uh, pleases me that um, La Cicciolina, the Italian porno MP and uh, wife of um, Jeff Koons, is sitting on, on the throne. Next. And on the left-hand side, um, a picture done for, uh, for Vogue magazine by uh, Snowden took this picture. Um, myself and five other architects were asked to do sandcastles. Great idea, you know, architects go off the beach. Sandcastles. I was really lucky because the, 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 the other ones kind of went on other days and the wind blew so much and it poured with rain so they're all rather sad looking. You know, typical day on the grey beaches of England but we got a bit of sunshine. Um, and I'd, I wanted to do uh, a sand city, not a sand castle. 
And you'll see later on that this refers to a drawing of mine about London. There's a River Thames, and uh, it's a very approximate representation, forgive me, that a shell is uh, Waterloo Station, and uh, there are little bridges, and the chain is Blackfriars Bridge, and his head is uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, and um, the Primrose Hill is a lobster pot, and uh, Watford is a few little pots right in the distance. But we took, we had a good time. We took a whole lot of stuff with us, including these little plastic airplanes, which most people think have been collaged on, collaged on afterwards. But Snowden's very finicky about his picture, so there was a thing like this. You know, somebody holding with wires, with a plane dangling down into the picture, which is all there to give it that sense of scale. Um, spoiled by the presence of me in the picture. But anyway. Um, it's a way of working with architecture which is kind of extemporary, enjoyable, out of uh, uh, the normal processes of working, but kind of very normal to me, about accumulation, about contrasting ideas, about playing with representation. A show that we designed at uh, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, I think is significant to mention here. It was uh, a, a work of uh, the work of the uh, Situationist International Movement, which was basically focused in France in the late 50s and, and early 60s, a movement that engaged a lot of artists, but they spent an awful lot of the time writing and defacing um, elements of, uh, of culture produced outside them, like um, rewriting the words in, in, uh, in strip cartoons and being um, uh, subversive within, within the art field. Uh, they also had a very interesting angle on the city. They used to talk about derives. You'll see that key word is up here. And derive meant that you would get to understand the city, not by just kind of taking routes that you plotted on a map, but by simply wandering through it. And in a place like Paris or London, that sort of wandering through it could, of course, reveal all kinds of unexpected occurrences, adjacencies, overlaps, um, uh, extremely exotic experiences, familiar experiences, frightening ones, and so on. I don't think you could derive in Los Angeles, really. I thought about that today. You're sort of deriving anyway, aren't you? You're going around in circles all the time in the same direction. But anyway. The, the other, another notion which was fundamental to their activity was of psychogeography, which, if you like, is the, the, the extension of what derive might mean when you think about maps. And, of course, they didn't want to think about maps as, as logical things, but in some way, maps which accumulated one's spatial experience and understanding of a place in a more psychological way. They were... They were, not, um, they were not maps that could, that could be measured in, uh, in conventional ways. It was a very difficult exhibition to design because lots of the work was very minimal. Lots of it was text. Here are some of the maps where they cut up the maps of Paris and put arrows all over them. Um, paintings which were, were done a bit like abstract expressionist paintings. There was painting by the yard that you could buy. You could go into the art shop and just say, oh, I have three yards of that. Um, and a lot of others that I didn't find particularly interesting, which were you know, just found things dumped on a canvas. But it was all done with, an, with a point in mind. It was all um, a kind of agitprop art. But the best thing to sum it up with is that they saw the city as a pinball machine. That was the metaphor uh, in Europe which helped explain um, uh, to um, the people that they were trying to get across to most clearly. Next. Next. So where do we start? What do we do? What do we act upon? What I've been leading up to is the, is the notion that instead of just designing the architectural object, you know, making it look nice, making it work nicely, that what we're really talking about is designing that space, creating that... Um, uh, the conditions between the object 
and the person who perceives it or the people that perceive it and take part in it that that space between um, perceiver and perceived is perhaps more important to work with than, um, than just making a, a statement of style. Next. And just with our hands, we can make quite important architectural, I mean, not important, significant, showing architectural experiments that can show a, a kind of tightness they can reveal next and that um, they can show tension. We can actually start with our bodies and our minds. And I guess it was kind of in that spirit that the work of the NATO group that Michael referred briefly to earlier, which I'm not going to talk about at length tonight because you can read about it, but so the, the new thing about NATO was that it was kind of operating from the heart it was operating from our own experiences. It wasn't taking uh, uh, codes of practice and improving them as its starting point. It was kind of situationist. It was terribly frightening to the architectural profession, the fact that there were these people who were doing funny drawings. And um, James Sterling, of course, bless him, um, said it wasn't architecture the work of my students. And he said it ought to fail. And uh, fortunately, he left the door open so that others could pass it. Um, and this, in the newspapers, the professional newspapers, frightened um, the profession to such a degree that quite often I still meet people who say, oh God, you're quite reasonable, really. I thought you were a punk rocker. It's a bit of a giveaway, isn't it? Older generation explanation of that. Uh, Punk rocker. NATO put forward um, a number of, uh, of, of, of projects which suggested that the development of the city should actually be much more inclined to use what was there already and not just to take the bulldozer as the norm but should actually tune in to the place as, as we found it, to think about the local culture, to find out what people did there, what people liked there, to find out what the class uh, uh, differences would be, to find out um, where uh, the local legends and mythologies lay, and that those things would be worked with, needed, into some sort of um, psych psychological extension of the present towards a future that we would um, uh, start to give shape to. But we would also add this other ingredient of narrative, which was a kind of additional set of legends that were there um, kind of like salt is in food to bring out the flavor of what was already there. And sometimes that salt would come from completely other circumstances. It would be a way of um, kind of accentuating what we were doing. Brian Hatton, a critic who's wrote, written quite a lot about NATO, uh, put together these NATO, NATO building regulations, and I'll read you a couple of them. Existing features of the site are adapted rather than building from scratch. Cityscape is treated as a natural formation, as a gardener might treat a landscape. Existing structures are also treated as a given, as fashion designers might treat the body uh, or basic, or a basic garment, or theatre designers the stage, or interior designers a raw space. Interior design is adapted as exterior design, occasional decor, or as a local door. Drastic alterations arise not only from functional operations of the program, but also from representational, poetic, or visionary interpolations of the site's history present activities and possible futures. Functions and representation are subject to the same rules, exchanging and combining roles. And there are lots more of them that you could look at in Data Magazine next week. 
And this is what this sort of thing looked like. Um, on the right is a project of Mark Kreisman's, which, um, which was an alteration of a housing estate in, um, in the Surrey Docks area of East London. He's added this sort of cafe at the bottom of a staircase, dressed up the staircase. And uh, local legend says that people get mugged quite often. So here's a whole heap of handbags that are the, from the, thrown away from muggings that have taken place on the estate. And there's actually a mugging going on at the top there. And the overturned car, and probably quite familiar, this sort of thing to you guys. And uh, greyhound racing. Greyhounds going around. The sort of, um, well, I'm just telling you what's in it. You make up your own mind. Next. Mark's drawings make look, mine look quite quaint, don't they? It's sort of old-fashioned. Anyway, these two are, are later drawings of mine. One on the left done for Vogue magazine for its 75th anniversary issue of what London might be like in 75 years' time. And um, it goes with a text that I'm not going to bore you with now. But the basic um, idea set up a much larger project that I went on to do called Exeter City. And um, I've already given you a couple of clues about it. Here's Buckingham Palace. Keep walking. Buckingham Palace here. You know, most rich piece of person in, in Britain lives in that. And uh, God lives in that. St. Paul's Cathedral. And very important road making them meet the Mall through Trafalgar Square, uh, the Strand. And the Strand was also very important, it used to be, because it had lots of little alleyways that went down to the river, which brought all the goodies for these people to coexist. So, ceremonial, most important ceremonial route in Europe. Still is. And, um, unfortunately, the, the bank of the Thames has uh, been filled in by Queen Victoria, and there's a sort of motorway going along the edge and um, the civic part of London is sort of full of flat bit. The, pl the part of London that everyone seems to want to go to is the bit in, in the centre, that is, is the bit with the little housing in Soho, which used to be full of sex clubs. Funny that that's where people want to go, even now. They don't want to go to the much more glorious embankment gardens that's full of imperial monuments. So um, this project really talked about how the, how the river had become a more significant civic space. But unlike the Champs-Élysées in its relationship to the Louvre, it actually said, well, this is a curved space, huge, but it could have a very important relationship with the Strand. And I suggest in the future that one of the things in the future that would have happened is that there have been stronger um, connection between the two and a lot of development along the river to take up uh, the possibilities of the river itself being a kind of park with lots of floating buildings. And in the meantime, this also suggested that King Charles in the year 2000 gave up Buckingham Palace as his own residence and gave it to the nation and um, to the Tate Gallery, which was an amusing thing to point out to him when he opened my exhibition in Brussels last November. He said, oh, really, perhaps. And um, this one, completely opposite. This is uh, a drawing done to talk about uh, the, the Saint de Sieg. And then from here, from LA, it sort of looks like where I live is more, is so fixed in the 19th century as the building is. Um, but anyway, the idea of the drawing is an accumulation of more um, uh, blurring surfaces, lots of textiles that kind of fuzz the edges of rooms. And um, there's a, a video Buddha which is playing constantly. And other additions, really adaptations to the way I live already, but I think it's also worth showing you this because it's it's quite a good example of a, of a so-called x-ray drawing, which, um, 
which looks at a network of interiors as though you could see all of them at once and actually wander around it as though you would in a real building. And it's turned out that drawings like this are actually far easier to show to clients than, um, than conventional architectural drawings. They quite like these sorts of drawings. They get very kind of cross if they don't get one. Next, please. Model making has been very important too. It was with, uh, when I was working with my students, and um, still is, a bit tidier now than, than this. But this was a project to um, show how the King's Cross area, the old shunting yards north of, um, the old shunting yards north of King's Cross and St Pancras Station. This King's Cross Station, St Pancras, and then there's this huge shunting yard which um, has been empty for years that used to uh, receive the coal that come down, came down from the north of England. Um, Norman Foster did a project for an enormous homogenous office development in this area. Well, we were asked to, do a sh to participate in a show called Metropolis at the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, along with um, other uh, designers including Zaha. For this, we made a, a, this huge model that sat on a base with crash barriers around it. And we made it in our, in our uh, manner out of everything we could find, which we thought we could express architectural masses and interactions and volumes with, like these old electric fire elements or the, um, those rubber gear stick covers on the left, which represent um, pyramids that are uh, blocks of housing and they actually moved which meant that it, the whole thing had a sort of train set quality that was heaved about. Um, but perhaps uh, equally I should tell you that this, this project we suggested to have any real validity for the city should, um, should have a strong idea about what goes on there. And we suggested that it should be called Eurofields and that it should be the interface between the business and cultural activity of the UK and of Europe. So you would be able to come here to meet ambassadors from European companies, or there would be trade fairs here, or there would be a museum in one of the old warehouses that we had, would have to preserve on the site. At least we did, I don't think Norman Foster did. Grade one, listed building. And um, in that, there would be electronically stored uh, all the works of art of the great museums around Europe. So that was the kind of temple of Europa. And various other kind of loose, uh, squidgy institutions um, that would in some way integrate culture, business, media, uh, design skills um, to make a field of urban activity that although it didn't look like the rest of London, in terms of scale and the way that all of its elements folded into one another, it was much more similar to Soho, the, um, the club and uh, nighttime area in the centre of London, than to uh, the rather overblown scale of, um, of um, imperial buildings along the Thames. Next. In terms of how I start to uh, how I begin the process of design, there are um, there are two aspects shown in these two slides, which I think are fundamentally important. That psychogeography idea in this um, uh, plan of uh, an aerial picture of that bit of the Thames um, is part of the Exeter City project. And it's at that stage at which one's trying to identify the major movements through the site of what one is trying to stress, like those arrows are reinforcing a movement through, through alleyways that have often been blocked off or had gates thrown across them or in some way don't work properly. And the incredibly important movement of the river and the kind of uh, uh, surf-like cutting of, uh, um, that I thought was important at the, at the point where this bridge meets the land. 
So it's completely subjective, but in some way comes from a sort of um, reading of the landscape, a bit like uh, aboriginals would read um, the surfaces of the desert. On the other hand, one would think about you know, what are the bits and pieces that make up uh, uh, the actual physical uh, composition of the building. And that just as in painting or in music and art, the sorts of things that I'm talking about are subject to exactly the sort, same sorts of rules of composition. Um, and you could find examples like this in painting for, you know, forever. Conventional one where together all the, all the elements are kind of, of equal status. Or a hybrid one where some sort of outside circumstance uh, transforms one of the elements to make a nod, an allusion to something else, or disparate, uh, where all the pieces have got apparently nothing to do with each other. This is a sort of Frank Geary thing going on here. Or this one, I called it ecstatic, you know, as though the word was my own. But where these, each of these ones inside the circle they're grouping in two directions. They're grouping to make an identifiable unit here, but they're also talking about you know, windows outside the particular situation. Next. And to give you a couple of examples of that, on the left, just the interior of the Noah's Ark project in um, the north of Japan, in Hokkaido, which, believe it or not, is a, is a new building. It looks old. That's what our client wanted us to do. He said, I want a classical building. And it, the site was triangular. And we had to build right up to the edges. And of course, classical buildings aren't triangular. So we had to think of a way. And we thought, aha, yes, boat. Boat on mountain. Boat, classical boat with temple. Yes, Noah's Ark, got it. And we wanted to... Um, to stress a kind of, um, of many senses of time, but mostly in this project, absolute ancientness, so old that no one could remember or knew where it had come from, especially in Japan, where you know, wooden houses are torn down and replaced by concrete buildings that uh, you know, more or less overnight. And that was part of what the fascination with European architects was actually about, was this, you know, this idea of a monumental vocabulary, they thought. Anyhow, this building has got elements in it which are you know, hybrid in that way. There are too many columns in this space. There are twice as many columns as we needed. But we wanted to signify a space that looked as though it had been carved out of solid rock, even though it was made of steel mesh and sprayed concrete. And the fact that these, t these columns are so close together gives a sort of graining of space from the outside to the inside, a bit like a Venetian blind. It gives the space direction. The tables, of course, are positioned in those bays. Now, I know that sounds like conventional interior design, but I think it means that there's a harmony between the tables and the columns. There's a line of columns over here which seem to stop as though they're not supporting anything and the upper part of them is painted black so it doesn't show kind of crude trick. And then above that there are a series of beams, of curved beams which are apparently just hanging in space and a, a keel going along the base of it. And in fact that is the suggestion of the hull of the boat something which you've either seen from the outside, but in terms of evidence in the building, you don't really see it until you get upstairs. There's just a bit that's there that um, seems uh, in addition to what you'd need. So in other words, there are significations in that space which are a lot to do with what's outside the space, what you actually can't see. And this puts, puts that sort of disparate vocabulary together in a slightly different way. It was a, um, an exhibition, a pretend shop done for an exhibition of shop design in Italy 
three years ago in a place called Arezzo. And every year they have this, this it's a kind of trade show, but in the center of the trade show, they, they ask the architects, and they, they like that year, to do pretend shops, and you're given a theme. Um, I remember uh, um, uh, Andrea Branzi, for example, was asked to do um, the same shop as I was, a body shop. I thought it was really important that there were lots of product in my shop, and um, most of the others didn't have any product in at all. In his body shop, he had a white floor and a glass ceiling, and it was sort of white, and it had two bowls of shampoo in it, and that was it. I don't think they really understood my project, but most of all, they didn't understand because um, person who had actually put all this stuff together and clearly hadn't figured out why it was called No Furs. Every bottle here has got a label on it that says No Furs London, as though that was uh, the brand of, of, uh, of perfume, of, of body care product. But it had a shop window with this same logo in nice kind of grown-up writing across the top of the window in gold leaf saying no furs, that was the name of the shop. But when you'd see it from a distance, it looked like a really, a really smart fur salon. It had a fur coat in the window that was borrowed from a local um, fur company. And they very proudly put their little card there, not realizing that I was taking the fish out of it. Anyway, the idea was to attract the ladies of Arezzo, of the good town Arezzo, and they really do like their fur coats there. So. Um, they would go into the shop because it looked like somewhere they'd want to go, and then they'd just see these little bottles with no furs in English, you know, not understand that kind of no fur, cosa, cosa vuol dire. And then a line of little video monitors, each one of which had um, a tape of, of uh, nice little um, animals playing in water, like otters and things. And then in front of it, uh, some translucent pictures of, of, um, of close ups close-ups of the women. And the idea was that you would kind of wander in and out, and by the time you got halfway into the shop, you'd realize, and therefore, you would overcome your initial desire to go into the shop and purchase lots of goods. Anyway, I didn't really understand. Next, please. Back to Schiphol. Schiphol International Airport, Amsterdam. Uh, grew to twice its um, previous size a few months ago. And um, it's frightening Heathrow, because Heathrow thinks it's top airport in Europe. But um, Schiphol can handle just as many planes, and probably will do in 10 years' time. They asked us to do something that it was extraordinary to hear coming from an airport authority, and that is that they thought it was a really good idea to make cafes and restaurants that people would actually want to go to for their own sake that the airport would be a destination in itself. Of course, what they really meant is that they'd want people to rather go there than go to Gatwick. Which in my mind, there's no competition whatsoever. But anyway, they asked us to do, um, to do two restaurants, one on top of a platform, which is a bit like a pier, and one in the main part of the departure hall. And although we'd done lots of references, made lots of references to aircraft, I and mean, this time we couldn't do that, so we thought about you know, where, why, pe why people were in airports and where they would like to go, and um, not about the business of flying, because you could see the jumbo jets outside the windows anyway. So we put um, a sort of forest on top of the, um, the pier, and lower down we made a kind of coral reef with these... Um, sofas that are very wavy and very uh, apparently irrationally placed, although you know, there is a sort of flow to them. It catches uh, the way people move around the airport. It's sort of like a beach, really. In fact, under here I've got a picture of a, of a beach with lots of cars and lots of people on the beach and then the sea. It's that sort of layering. It's about nature. It's about landscape. It's not about architecture in the conventional sense, and it doesn't even have the artifacts of conventional architecture because there are no walls, there is no roof, there are no elements of enclosure. It's entirely created 
from objects and had to be uh, in a way because it was in the middle of the, of the depart departure hall. But it nevertheless, I think, makes spaces. There is a notion of water here with this floating, um, and the, this suspended uh, uh, water surface, which actually had a kind of water projection um, being shined upon it, so it seemed to move. And lots of these fish that are, brought, that are made from that aircraft aluminium mesh, um, and then they're, they're molded in resin. Next. And these are the trees upstairs, which are disguising um, the ducks. And um, they sort of make a space a bit like a, um, a glen does. A, bit, a few trees makes a space in an open landscape. It doesn't have to have walls. Next. And then looking from above, from on the, on the tree level down, the water surface, not quite so elegant from above. And uh, these tables, which sprout from the underside of the, the coral reef, and um, well, so there's as few legs as possible. So the whole thing has got this feeling of, of, of floating, um, the suggestion of being underwater. So put simply, the way we work is not from you know the site, the brief, design it in plan, do an elevation. We think, first of all, about the situation. And the situation has, I think, these three components, principally. What it's going to be, what it's going to work as, the youth, in this, in this case, airport, cafe, place, airport, sign, landscape, beach, water, fish, all that stuff. And what one's trying to do is kind of keep them all in balance. The sign, if you like, is what I mean by the narrative. It's that extra thing which is not required by this basic use and place relationship. Next. Next, please. And I see the process of designing as a kind of spiral uh, of weaving, an adaptation of that, of that triangle, that constant triangle of situation being taken through a number of stages. So in the beginning, you know, the first few days of the project, in the actual phase, we'd collected a few postcards, got some pictures of fish and underwater spaces, but we didn't really know what it was going to look like as a design. And then you start to think, well, you know, how am I going to express this? Am I going to fill the departure hall up with water? No, impractical. So I have to think of other ways of expressing, you know, being underwater. I have to think of metaphors. Then you have to think of how all this lot is going to choreograph itself together, as in, you know, psychoenergy, another way of saying psychogeography, of actually displacing these objects in, in the given space. And then I put extemporize, meaning kind of not spend too long sweating over it, kind of get to some ideas quickly enough to make sure they're fresh, actually fuse all this lot together. Next. Back to the Thames, our dear old father Thames, and um, a fake, uh, a fake design uh, program. A counterfeit uh, design tool, which I'd like to do really. And um, most of these have, have a, uh, this is based on a 3D idea where you have plan, you know, side view, um, uh, side view A, side view B, whatever. And that they come together as the three dimensional image in this square. We've added in lots of other tools over here, lots of signs, and traffic lights, you know, all kinds of stuff. In fact, there are probably hundreds more down here if you click on the column. But we've replaced the, the um, plan and elevations with place, use, and narrative. Or, excuse me, but narrative is what 
sign was on that previous slide. Same thing. And situation is them all together. So what have we got then? We've got place, aerial view of Thames and the Strand and the Old Witch and Waterloo Bridge, etc. The way it's being used now, traffic, buildings, gardens, traffic, river, lots of lines, no movement through it. Narrative, nothing. Just a canary walk. Situation, traffic out. Next. So that's the actual. And this is the metaphoric. And we've got, um, under edit, we've got a new edit tool called Exercise. And there's a sub-menu under it, it says split, shatter, gel, set, pitch, height, soften. Yeah, and I'm sure you've got lots more. You should be able to invent your own, you should be able to customise that bit. So the place has gone a bit kind of different, as a reclining figure, one of my favourites. And the use, we're actually looking at it a different way. We're looking at all the traffic and all the signs and all the people, and we're really looking at the street, actually, as though it was a real piece of, um, you know, it is the activity of the city. And the narratives are getting a bit risky, aren't they? They're sort of bomb things. They look as though they go, there's a bomb. Situation, not sure. Next. Well, there's that psychogeography thing back again. Well, it's been exploded, uh, to, the window's been enlarged, because that's the bit we're working on, and we've got height on here. So presumably it's about to make these things kind of bigger, or allow the colours, or slightly more aggressive, or move them around a bit. Next. huge painting for the show, it was five metres long, two and a half metres high. Could you focus it on the left? Please. I can't possibly explain all these bits. But the strand is the red thing. The embankment is adjacent to the river, of course. And you can see quite easily that the idea here is that there's a blending between um, the body, the existing city, um, and then adding to with a new rather natural phenomena of structures which seem to be half architecture, half boat, which seem to be half um, rational and half controlled by nature. There are new spaces added to the river bank, like this space for, um, it's like a Colosseum space of public dispute adjacent to Lincoln's Inn Fields where the lawyers work or Somerset House, which Richard Rogers proposed should be exposed to the river again by sinking the road in front of it so it goes underneath. And I've put these jetties coming out into it. Or these buildings, which are, um, well, never intended to be fixed, and they're, of course, places for people to move, to walk, and would have constructions on these huge pontoons in the river but um, they've probably got more to do with roadways, highways, than they have with um, conventional buildings. And that sort of overlaying, of splicing, of weaving, um, is, I think, uh, an important way of thinking how the, d the city could develop. But of course, I'm not trying to say that this is a plan. It's much too splodgy to say, you know, this is how London should be. What it's meant to be is, is, to, is to set a kind of 
um, cultural condition in which one could think about um, the way uh, uh, London could develop. And this is in the, uh, in the light of the fact that more often than not, authorities and individuals are, are scared of this sort of thinking in architecture. Most people you know, have got lots of channels, the television, they flip channels like that. They can carry around lots of things in their head. Most uh, kids are computer literate. And yet, when it comes to architecture, there's this extraordinary set of values which mean um, that it's either supposed to be um, a respectable modern piece of design or it's intended to be fit in. I call this, um, this approach kind of soft planning. It's not about clearing these spaces. It's not necessarily about um, designing things which are really even have the status of building. It's about a much more fluid, much more technological, much more electronic, much more responsive um, kind of, of architecture, which is closer to uh, a biology than it is to um, bricks and mortar. Thanks. And when this show was put together, it was intended to be a field in which you thought about some of these things. It wasn't intended to be prescriptive, but uh, a provocative um, uh, series of visual citations. Hence, there were a series of layers, like the first layer, you practically trip over when you went into the room, with these kind of milestone objects that had some classical images, images that were, let's say, that helped us define what the, the key components of the city might be. And this one was the Tower of Babel, pasted over it, is the center of one of the other pictures. In fact, they'd all got part swapped to say that the city consists of these things that we know, but we can always, um, God, the voice thing is going for Okay, you're adjusting it. Am I, is my voice changing that often? Behind them were uh, a series of videos, one of the construction site, one of the marketplace, a uh, pop video, Super Mario game, and so on. Elements of the city that, was, that I thought were it's important to keep in mind when thinking about uh, his future. And then there were a series of statements above it um, that were saying the sorts of things I've been saying to you this evening, but also saying that perhaps there should be uh, a levy on all buildings, which doesn't just mean 1% for art, but maybe more, 10% for another kind of architecture which doesn't have a precise use isn't on a precise piece of land. 10% for an intermediary architecture was the, the notion that was put forward. And this kind of intermediary nature was reinforced by the fact that there were three more versions of this big drawing, this big painting, on um, one of those rotavision display machines. And here you can see it in a, another form, an effort. It's a, well, it's the same, same bit of London, but different things are happening in each of those. So there was a sort of mechanical sense of movement as you walked into the room, as well as the movement of the visitors themselves. Next. Okay. That one of Somerset has again, where the water goes back into the arches of the old building. The old building is revered but it kind of puts the test as being redressed in, in um, other rather wacky clothes. And at the other end of the room, um, that, that thing about the future of London um, reprinted at vast scale. And a projection of a series, like a, a motorcycle ride around that bit of London that we did some quite good computer graphics with. Next had things like this in it where buildings were jumping over the, the um, river wall or these coffee houses that parked themselves on the strand blocking the traffic. Next. Next. And this led to some, 
some other actually real projects in, that we're doing in Brussels with uh, an office that we collaborate with sometimes there. And they got um, a very windswept 60 tower block that's on the um, inner circular road around the city. And it's got this rather horrid space in front of it that is so windy that um, people don't go there. The, the, there are a lot of um, very uh, busy shops along here. This bit goes down to the old city. And um, there's a shopping arcade through that building. The, the dotted arrow goes out uh, to uh, an area that's dominated by a black community. And in, I mean, this is very crude, but it's, it's the same way of working that I've been showing you before. We've got here the, the negative things at the top. Fucking windy, urban decline, no single identity, management, confusion, positive, melting pot, city pot, night as well as day in Borderville, because there are lots of Borderville theatres there. And there are urban groups up here who, you know, in, in the whole area who have got completely different interests. This African group is in the Tongue community. The interest of the people who work in the offices, um, popular shopping area, but there are also some extremely cheap and rather off putting to everyone else's shop. And there are four clients there's the Metro System, the Ministry of Public Works, the Commune de Chen, and the Swedish Bank that owns the block. So, we're kind of staking out all the problems, chucking everything onto that first sheet, and then starting to work with them. And um, you know, a crude drawing program like this is great for doing this stuff because you can shunt things around, make them bigger and smaller, and really play with them. Um, so, it's this thing that looks like a chop, something is neat, isn't it? It's a, uh, a soft structure which is supported by, um, uh, potentially by a tower. This isn't finished, by the way, we're doing it now. And some huge advertising billboards. And, um, and things to, to reduce the wind, and a whole lot of, um, of wind absorbers that our engineers tell us is kind of really good idea to, to suck the wind up before it gets to the people underneath, and uh, a marketplace underneath. Next. And this opportunity to work in kind of Brussels, to exercise Brussels, uh, came because my extra city show went to uh, a place called the Fondation pour la Future in Brussels. And um, here it had quite a lot of other projects in it too, uh, projects that we'd realized and um, some pieces of furniture so that it helped the viewers there to get a handle on some of the other things that we were doing. Next. So I'm going to show you some of this furniture you haven't seen in yet. This is the first object that Prince Charles saw when he visited the exhibition. And he um, insisted on sitting on it, but we didn't get any pictures of that. And um, this is a tongue chair. There so are lots of these for various projects, and you know, they're sold by Joseph Copley, a small furniture company in London. And from the front, it looks really conventional. But when you go around the back, it's just to come out and it's put on its knees. Next. And this is the same thing looking from the other direction. And in terms of making the damn thing, it's, it's really um, very conventional indeed. It's a wooden um, chair frame, which fortunately they can make in England. It's quite difficult to explain how we want it its leg, instead of in a conventional chair, of course the leg would come down like that. And all we've done is tilt it backwards so that the leg, this leg, goes up inside, up to here. But it's the same square section bit of wood, and it's even got a stud on the end, which is always quite amusing, because we never touch the ground. And this is a piece of furniture that I wish we had produced in more than one copy but there's only one. In fact, that's gone now, too, because this is one of our shops in Tokyo, and, of course, Tokyo is high turnover. Bongo lasted for seven years, which in Tokyo time is an absolute eternity. Uh, this, the Catherine Hamlet shop in Tokyo, uh, lasted for about five, I think, but it was closed about two months ago. 
And I really like that table. I think it's got elegant simplicity with these spring-like legs, each one with a kind of shield, like a shin pad on it. A single piece of timber and glass top that isn't square, it's slightly soft in shape. And one of my mannequins, this is a male one behind. And you can see that story of the softening of the space going on here. Instead of doing lots of fussy stuff in the corners of the room, um, just to uh, help blur this. Next. These were two of the very first pieces of furniture I did about 85. And I was really, um, I was really possessed by, by the, by the expression of the potential of classical pieces of furniture. Odd, but I, th I think they're really beautiful. The way that that uh, animals, legs, and other limbs are incorporated into the idea of a, of a chair in Greek, Roman, Etruscan furniture, and hence this little pair of feet that were especially um, cast by a friend of mine, carved and cast by a friend of mine, the Or well, this one, which was the other idea I had at the time. There were only two ideas for that first, this two first collection, and that was the idea of a droopy, a droopy chair. Next. And these kind of got a bit more confident, and especially working with Italian manufacturers who could handle frames for chairs that weren't just wood. And um, this one's called the Gallo Collection. This is an armchair. It hasn't really got an arm, it's rather got wings. I suppose it's a wing chair. And um, it's got that sort of contrast that the tongue chair has with the seat becoming the back leg and the front legs becoming the back. And when it, when it became a sofa, it sort of went a bit wrong. It's too deep here, isn't it? It's not right. Anyway, they insisted on, you know, the first prototype they do, they've already got the pictures done and in the catalogue before you can say anything. It's unbelievable. It happens over and over again. Next. The mannequin. Female one. She woman and he man. Sold very nicely. Made hundreds of those. And table of the world using the same polished aluminium technique. Here's a map of England. There's all these pieces about England. And a chair of the world. And a Toby jug. I don't know if any of you know what a Toby jug is. It's a rather horrid, thick 19th century object with um, a tricorner hat on a very merry looking fat man. Um, it's the ideal vessel for beer. So there's a Toby jug with a glass. And next to it is um, a huge tanker which says one pint on it, etched into the side of it. But it's not really one pint, it's about three pints. And um, the Chair of the World is part of a series of eight which were done for a hotel in the north of Japan. And it's, this is the one with the, the um, Chippendale back. Next. And at that time, it seemed, um, it seemed that we could do everything, especially with, with my agent in Japan, was dead excited about designing everything from bath robes to cars to lots. And thank God it didn't really happen, but you know, they did start drawing all this stuff. We got um, contracts drawn up for pens and for stationery and for clothes and all kinds of stuff. And this is the luggage. Um, it's okay, but you know, certain points you have to be not to do too much. And that's just a typical sheet of, of, uh, of chair drawing, in which you see that what I was doing in this one was taking that sofa as I've already done it, and then trying to work with the ideas and see how to do new pieces that were based on similar ideas. Next. A vase that was done for Sheridan Copley, um, called the Choker Vase. Of course it's an amphora, really, a Roman or an Etruscan amphora, but instead of being supported at the bottom, 
is supported around the collar of the slave, which is accentuated by the crystal, the black crystal being sandblasted, and it looks just like rubber, doesn't it? And um, this is a table done for for an exhibition, um, a furniture fair exhibition. And uh, the larger version of the earlier one, this is a Europa table, and it's got two stools, and it was at the time, done at the time when the two halves of Europe didn't know each other. So um, they could have drinks together, they could have vodka or whiskey or whatever from a, from a sort of rocket decanter. And there are, there are rocket candlesticks and uh, satellite dish um, glasses. Next. These are the chairs that were done um, in England for you know, the art project. When they were all dumped outside just before they were taken into the building. Like it. It's about interlocking bits. And it's a, an adaptation of the English Windsor chair done for um, you know, the English Windsor chair done out of the seat, is done out of a huge single block of wood. And it's shaped so that your body fits into it. But in this case, instead of having the wheel back chair, it's got a, um, a, a single piece that looks a bit like an ancient piece of farm equipment. I mean, the, the texture and form comes from uh, yoke and, um, and uh, harness or, or plants and oxen and all that. And on the left, uh, the different narrative, this is one that we hear better at It's a wardrobe and it's got you know, some shelves in it and you put your clothes behind these kind of stretchy bag-like uh, surfaces. And it's in fact a, an adaptation of a piece that I did with, uh, with NATO, which is a wardrobe that um, I knocked up while we were all knocking up stuff in the AA workshop. But it's, it's, this has gone sort of almost too sophisticated compared to that early NATO. Next. a bottle, a vase, that was actually designed by Alessandro Mendini, and he asked a hundred designers to decorate it, and um, most of them were left white, and they would have a sort of painting on the side, <laughs> or whatever. Um, I thought it was important to change the colour of the whole thing, when they were blue. but then I decorated it with pictures of itself, with flames coming out of the bottom. And this neon modular man is part of a, um, an exhibition that a friend and I, Stuart Town, the painter, and I took part in, in uh, Le Corbusier Unité d'Habitation in Firmini in, in fairly south France, not, not too south. And um, the idea of the exhibition was that, um, that all the artists were invited to reconsider the notion of the family in, um, in this building, since the majority of people that lived in it were immigrant, students, gay people, um, single mothers, etc. There's no notion of the modular family anymore. So what we did is to, um, in very simple terms, just put signs around the space that in some way suggested another kind of occupation of the place that I suppose is this middle ground. It's the middle ground even between two people, two lovers who live there, let's say, who in some way uh, kind of use the space as the, as the um, the chamber in which their daily life takes place. At the bottom of the stairs, you'd see this neon modular man. And I think it looks pretty good with the landscape behind, with all these little suburban homes, which is what people there really want. They don't want to live in this building. They'd rather live in those things. And um, modular man has had one very important addition, which is called Next. Out. We painted 
the wall inside, adjacent to called red bit on the outside. We continued the red all the way through, went right the way through and into the bedroom, which this is a this is a one child bedroom flat. And the parents have the room above the sitting room. But the one bedroom that was formerly so is about four foot wide and about forty feet long. Great bedroom. So we thought we'd make it more like that. So we built a wall down the middle of it. And you could only get from one side of the wall to the other when you were in bed. Next. We've done a lot of work for a, a, um, a fashion group called Jigsaw. They have about 20, 25 shops all together. And we've done about five or six of them and uh, our furniture and mannequins and stuff are in lots of the others. And the biggest one that we've done is in Knightsbridge, in that smart bit of London, where the start of the shop is here. And you enter at this point, and a scoot upwards in the staircase to burst through a huge carpet into this upper floor which in the tradition of Knightsbridge shops is a kind of salon. The clothes aren't expensive, they're very accessible, um, but we wanted to, to give this shop a bit of grandiosity that would um, act as the flagship store for the, for the whole group. But when I get back to London, we'll be opening a new perfume hall for Liberties, and then this is in the glass uh, blowers workshop where we're making these enormous bottles. They're about... Um, two foot six high, three foot high. And uh, each one of them is a variation on the type of um, the original chemist bottle that there were a lot of in chemist shops in England. Like this is the standard one, the one in the middle, with a pointed top. And in old chemist shops, these would be filled up with coloured liquid. So the whole series, there are actually 12 of them, but this one one on the left has got a double spike for a top, and this one has got a shorter stem, but a very much taller stopper with a kind of spiral around it. Next. And then some shots of the big saw shop, the big one in Knightsbridge, with that proscenium arch -like, like opening, strengthened by the fact that this column in the middle has been disguised in copper and it's sort of like a sculpture, like a caryatid. It's a separate object. So it allows the, in fact, in structural terms, all these, common, all these columns are of equal importance. But with this handling, it means that we've made a huge window frame into the shop, through which you can see that there's quite a lot of movement inside the shop. But you know that you actually have to go in to find out the way all these bits fit together. That's when you're walking along the pavement, there's Harrods in the distance. I think this has got, you know, the intended cheap. It's sort of bargain its way out of the street. And of course, we can't come out into this bit. It's not allowed to be in that bit, because that's public land. But at this point, you know, that's the boundary where we can do what we like. So we set the glass back, valuable retail space, of course. But um, I think... It works that the glass is suppressed in, in relation to, to these things which kind of challenge the visitor to go inside those doors and up the stairs to uh, the first floor. Next. Second floor, I mean. And at the top of the stairs, you immediately get a sense of the, the surround of the clothes all around the room. Although the edges of the room are all softened, the, um, the ceiling and the walls have, um, there is no formal corner, there's no corner either. They just seem to merge one into the other. It's a room without corners, but it's sort of more or less square and more or less given um, a sense of kind of direction by these mirrors and um, tables in front of them and this cash desk with this very serpentine leg and this shelving unit which has actually got one leg 
and is um, tied onto the, one of the four columns in the center of the room, which gives them the feeling of being sort of wheelbarrows or you know, their vehicles as much as they are people in the Next. Other jigsaw shops, we want, each one of them, we want to make site specific, of course. So, you know, the problems of the place give you certain clues as to how to resolve that. Like this jigsaw shop in another part of London has a very low ceiling height and um, a very low window, consequently. So we we set the window out as far as we could into the street. And then inside the shop was full of columns. It was a rather horrid fixed building. So we didn't bother with trying to soften any of the ceiling. We put all the attention on the floor. Now, since all these shops are intended to have a have a, a garden-like uh, feel, they're meant to be the, uh, sunny and bright, natural. We thought here the the um, pastoral qualities could come out as a kind of pond. So we made. Uh, a simulated pond. And of course, it's not pretending to be real because you can walk on it, and it consists of a photograph, a huge photograph of water lilies repeated four times. So it's a bit like a carpet. It's a work of art on the floor. And then it's got a sort of bridge across it, which is mirrored glass with ribs on it. And we were a bit worried that people wouldn't um, wouldn't cross it. But fortunately, they're really keen to get at the clothes, and I tell you, they walk off anything to get to the They charge across here without even second door. And the cash pill here is a sort of boat. And um, similar lighting, lots of details and the colour, and the flavour of it, the mood of it, being similar to other jigsaw shops. Next. Next. This is the. Um, Otaru Hotel, the Naritimo Hotel, in an old bank building in a port town in Hokkaido, in the north of Japan. This port town was very rich once, and um, imported stuff from the United States, lots of passenger lines, but now, like many port towns, there isn't there isn't very much traffic there, and it's becoming a bit of a, a resort. So our client wanted to make a hotel in the old bank building that was the biggest bank on Main Street. So this is the old banking hall, but now made into a restaurant, which, in a sense, um, will set the scene for the whole for the whole hotel, which we treated as a kind of encyclopedia of the world. The restaurant has a map for a floor and is kind of global in concept. It serves fish dishes from all over the world. There are a series of water tanks down here where the teller's desk, desk used to be. The chairs of the world you've seen already. And these suspended translucent fabrics got birds flying all over them, apparently. The lighting is organized like those weather maps with warm and cold fronts. And upstairs around the balcony, there are lots of little tables. Can't see here, but kind of near to here. There are tables with um, particular bird sightings showing their migration patterns across the world. The upper part of the room is meant to be sort of like the weather. It's meant to feel like the outside, but in a rather kind of um, special way. It's not meant to look like the outside, but to feel like the outside. Next. And this um, encyclopedia of the world theme comes out in various ways, like the main staircase of the hotel, which has about 24 rooms, um, has panoramas of peoples of the world. Or the rooms are organized around the series of ports, each one of which has its own chair. This Manhattan chair has got a back like a, like a drain cover. And there are four rooms off this, this little lobby. And each one of these rooms is a different version of the Manhattan idea. So there is one with the Statue of Liberty's face behind the bed and on the 
one based on a yellow taxi. So, next. And the Bombay port. This is one of the rooms off the Bombay port. Well, you know, the windows are thick. There's not much chance of a mosquito getting in there, but you know, fun to be playful. And um, downstairs in the basement, a little nightclub that was, um, I mean, it was just done up by smearing paint over the walls and putting in a few lights, a bit of furniture, and these suspended gauzes. Next. Another very complete world was the, the club that we did in Istanbul that opened about three years ago called Taksim. And Taksim, uh, 30,000 square feet of some revelrous space, including restaurants, two discotheques, uh, lounge rooms, and so on. It was so big that we had to be really careful how we spent our clients' money. And um, this building, an old dying work, we couldn't afford to spend a lot of money on the outside. So we basically left it as it was and put new things inside, like these windows, of course they're all new, and suggest a completely separate structure inside um, the existing one. We made no repairs whatsoever, you can see the big chunks of concrete and this has been repaired and etc. Next. And um, this is the restaurant behind those, those windows, which have got a, a traditional Turkish textile pattern on Glass, on the glass. We did special furniture for it that was sort of inspired by um, Turkish turbans. And those suspended cloths are a reference to the fruit markets of Istanbul. And this, of course, would be the first place where, um, where most of the visitors would go. They'd go and eat there. And then they would be drawn off to the discotheque. You know, some wouldn't have the heart to do it, but in the meantime, lots of other younger people who weren't so interested in meeting would have arrived. And of course, lo and behold, guess what the theme of this is going to be airport. Next. There's a walkway that connects the restaurant through the discotheque, which we originally wanted to be a travelator, which cuts across the entrance space so you can see people when you enter the club going across the space higher up than you giving that, that feeling of overlap and movement. And that's the um, Italian producer's uh, uh, picture of the chair. Next. And in the main discotheque, in fact, the handling of the space was relatively simple. I mean, there, was, there was nothing fancy done to the edges. It was basically to do with ramps and balconies and staircases and being able to get the people around the building being able to see from one level to another. But the treatment of the space was just, um, just we just used car paint to, to spray it. That's why it's blue. Or, and we borrowed things, or rather we're, we, we were given things by Turkish Airlines, like this, uh, this um, cargo container, which is converted into a video booth that um, shows the new films all the time. Thank, oh uh, sorry, next. And um, just recently, we've been involved in a, an initiative for a rather dull area of London called Croydon, which was heavily developed in the 60s with um, these, these tower blocks, some of which are government buildings. Fifteen practices were invited to, um, to cheer the place up. And we were given the rather awful job of Clearing up the car park, which are pretty nasty structures. Other practices, like um, um, Mark Fisher, who invented some lighting effects that would, of course, change minute to minute. So they would, at night, give the impression of a much lighter effect of those buildings. And this was done for the catalogue, but basically uh, was the best way of representing the interactive disc that was part of the exhibition. You can like see that there are three rectangles here. They're all versions of the map of this bit of Croydon, and they have the car parks in the yellow. And in the bottom one, the green bit uh, add-on to it, 
in the middle one, there are metaphors for new activities which will be brought to the top of each of those car parks. But, and in the very top picture, um, the narrative idea, which was to associate each of these seven car parks with the seven hills of Rome, which is a bit of a tall order for Croydon, but anyway, you know, trying to think about what Croydon wants to be, it wants to be a real city. And on the, on the right, expanding those things. So if in the interactive, uh, on the screen, you touch, say, that car park, then you know, it can shoot up in this box um, in bigger version, or in there, you get a, a video clip that you see in the top right-hand corner. Next. Let's see those a bit closer. So these are buttons. And all the car parks are buttons and so on. Um, indicating another kind of psychogeography which seems to be the one that we or one of the ones that we should be working with now. But um, the way we handle this was to say, well if if we if we are going to make these these car parks um, be thought of as hills, first of all you need to change the name of them so they wouldn't any longer be called car parks. But they need to suggest hills by very simple means. So each of these add-ons are you know, relatively modest. They're intended to just give enough green and um, signify that new use. But the new use would always be you know, a very urban one, one about the kind of civic activities that Croydon doesn't really have. Next. So there's a bit more detail of oh, the cruise sign of hill the feeling our way and this curved car park which in this we've added on um, a, an auditorium space and a stage and using trees to define that stage space Sadler's Wells is a, a garden theatre in London and all of these hills we associated with with um, uh, cultural facilities and sports facilities that people in London already know. Just a step towards, again, defining a mood in which um, these car parks might be sold. And disappointingly, some of the other architects did projects which were very much finished. Uh, Richard Rogers did a sort of telecommunications tower, besides the size. And as Colin Amory, a rather uh, sharp young critic in England, said, he would have done exactly the same thing had he been after it as something in Bombay. Next. This was um, a competition project for, an invited competition for a museum of the word in, um, in Swansea, in Wales. And um, Swansea was ravaged by bombs war. But it has a beautiful landscape quality and it's adjacent to the sea and it has a very beautiful local stone which is this green plate. So we wanted to give we wanted to give this project some um, some real standing, some civic standing. So we thought, well, let's quote the Acropolis, but in a very smooth down uh, Welsh uh, landscape feeling. It doesn't have the statue of Pallas Athena, it has a huge head, which is supposed to be sponsored by Mont Blanc. And it has a gateway and the ram, and it has the general composition of the Acropolis, with the main part of the museum housed in this little temple above it. And lots of the functions inside it, um, lots of restaurants and uh, writers' meeting spaces happening um, in. Uh, an exchange between left and right of the building uh, focused around this stair tower that you see people through the landscape in the centre. Next, we're doing a, a small project um, which in fact will be our first building in England. This is a new 20th century gallery for um, the Jeffrey Museum in the East End of London. and. Um, it's housed in a series of 17th century almshouses. These bits, which English heritage says we can't touch, 
of course, and can't be, our new building cannot be visible from the principal view side of the almshouses. So what we've done is taken the two contrasting vocabularies, one of the brick structure, uh, which forms the main horseshoe, which is the houses, the principal galleries, and then a much more fluid, and organic one of uh, landscape-like surfaces of glass, which um, enclose a, li a little piazza-like space that means when you come out of the exhibit at the end of this block, you'll see these two um, building ends and not be, being sure quite which way to go, you'll go between them and then discover that they, they join up. We've got topiary quotes of great objects of 20th century design in the garden all around it. Next. And this is what it might look like inside. This is another x-ray drawing. Not very focused. We come out of the museum here into this kind of free zone in the middle and then the wall starts to break down into um, room settings that tell the story of the interiors of the 20th century. Next. A project for a competition the Tokyo Forum. I'm showing you all these so you can see that there's a, there are certain constant themes of kind of uh, incorporation of natural form, a public space, gaffer like space, protected from the rest of the city, but adjacent to the bullet train track, um, a bit like the piazza in Siena, that's an example. And those are the upper roof structures, the, the upper of three uh, artificial landscapes, a bit like banners and flags that you might see at the Palio in that same Next. We're going to finish with two buildings in Tokyo. This one we finished uh, a couple of years ago, and it's called The Wall. And um, it's a sort of building that kind of critics are not quite sure how to handle because it's, um, it's so respectful of the origins of architecture that it is uh, a wall that looks as though it, we have found it. Of course, there was nothing there before, yeah, but it's like, like many Roman walls, it looks as though it's been adapted over and over again, with arches built in, doors open, and blocks, and windows, new windows made, and so on. But what we were trying to do with this very long and narrow site, well, it's certainly narrow from front to back and it is side to side, was to make um, a, a solution to a very common um, problem in Tokyo, which is to make tall buildings that people are not afraid to explore. There are very often bars or shops six stories up in the air, and in Tokyo people use these sorts of buildings as, um, as we use the streets. So I wanted to do something with the stairs, a bit like New York Fire Escape. Um, it seems to be stuck on, but in fact that you would go up the stairs by going in through this door, and then inside the wall, and out again. So it stitches its way up the building. You're going in and out of the building all the way up. And then all the usable floors, which, were, uh, which are bars and restaurants, are like shelves sticking backwards to the building. So it really is a series of layers with this um, rather gasometer-like structure of steel or uh, fire escape that has got these kind of these, these bronze sculptures punctuating it quite a practical manner. It, um, it is then uh, creates a, a tension, a space between itself and the, and the actual wall, which incidentally was built by two uh, little um, Italian bricklayers that it took from a village in Italy uh, to Japan to do the job because the, the Japanese British really couldn't get the idea of this sort of food-like way of handling brick and stone of mixing together. In Japanese, the word for brick is the same as the word for tile. It's exactly the way they use it. Next. Some of the cast iron work in that screen structure. And the drawing, one of the drawings that we did very early on, which 
tend to express this sort of movement up through the building. And the sense of the building somehow still building itself with these cranes on the top of it, apparently falling up those lumps of snow. This was a building done in response to a very strange response for the time. It's a bit like a Volvo one, it was an any matter one. So your pardon. He asked for um, a building that looked as though it had been there forever. I think he had the Arc de in mind. But one that symbolized the, the 21st century. So this is what we came up with. Next. Next. One of those sculptures on the wall, done by a um, British sculptor called Jessica Thomas. And on the right, the entrance of the building that we just opened last week, which is adjacent to it, which is a, a sister institution to the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, which is called the Penrose Institute of Contem Contemporary Arts after one of its founders. Next. And um, two versions of it. This, was, this is an earlier drawing than this one. I mean, originally we wanted it to be uh, a very um, industrial, uh, silo-like building that um, was a gallery by virtue of the fact that you would move up the lift at the back of the building from one space to the next, a bit like you move in a conventional gallery horizontally. Of course, we still had to do that because the site is so small, the site is specific. Um, anyway, it, it evolved into this form. Next. And it looks like this in the daytime. It's got a series of sliding shutters which are um, intended to make the building look different according to what's happening inside it. And since each one of these floors is a gallery space suitable for the showing of one um, installation piece, then um, it's important to close out the street. And um, the surface of the, of the building is, is clad in a diamond-shaped terracotta tile that bows for the request of the client for there to be a natural finish to the building. It was a bit of a pain because we wanted it to be steel. And it's got a, a, a network of lights on top of it. And then these uh, deliberately contrasting um, balcony details in cast aluminium. That client really doesn't like the shine of it. He's much happier with the sort of dull bit. Next. And this is what it looks like at the moment, at night, adjacent to the, to the wall, which um, already kind of pleased me because it looked like an oil uh, refinery at night. And of course the lights um, take over from the actual form of the building is a solid and the dish on the roof, which is intended to be a facility for artists to project onto, um, was lit up for the first time just last Thursday. So, I'm um, leaving, leaving Tokyo uh, on Friday. Been here for a few days. I'm going back to London. And I told you about Tokyo and London. And I'm waiting to see what this experience of being in LA will do. I guess I won't have to, I'll have to wait to find out in London. Anyway, thanks for being here. I've enjoyed seeing you.